Greetings everyone, one and all, welcome once more. As always, I am your most humble host, Jay. I return once more from the void between pages to again tell of the bizarre and the unknown. So sit and relax as I again share with you what I've been reading. Sometimes, good people must do bad things in order to succeed. Other times, bad people must do good things to meet their goals. Morality is a fickle thing, it's not inherently black and white. Our first title has nothing to do with that at all, with bad people doing bad things. Crime Syndicate, written by Andy Schmidt, with the art crew consisting of Kieran McOwen on pencils, Dexter Vines on the ink, and Steve Olaf on the colors, is a six-issue miniseries published earlier this year, and focuses on the eponymous team of sometimes heroes, but usually villains, the Crime Syndicate. For those not totally familiar, the Crime Syndicate first appeared in 1964, way, way back in issues 29 and 30 of Justice League of America, in the now-famous storyline of Crisis on Earth 3. Earth-3 is commonly thought of, and occasionally depicted as, nothing more than an obligatory, heroes are evil, villains are good universe, but this is ultimately a simplification of matters. The original pre-Crisis Earth-3 was a full-on role swap slash inverted history universe, where history is largely the same, but pretty much every major figure in global history has had their roles inverted, sometimes being outright swapped for someone else who shared the same role in real life. The original Earth-3 appearance uses two specific examples, where Benedict Arnold was the leader of the American Revolution, and George Washington was a cowardly traitor who betrayed them, or where John Wilkes Booth was president during the Civil War, until he was assassinated by disgruntled actor Abraham Lincoln. The crime syndicate embodied this as well, being individuals with all the same powers and abilities as the Justice League of Earth-1, but who used them to commit crime and other acts of villainy. The Syndicate would make infrequent appearances over the years after their debut, up until Earth-3 was erased during the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths. From there, the Syndicate would largely lie dormant, being brought up a few times and still managing to make a few appearances despite literally not existing anymore, up until Earth-3 was brought back following Infinite Crisis. From there, we've had about three or four different versions of the Crime Syndicate, with each and every reappearance feeling like a totally reinvented version of the characters each time. This miniseries is no exception, of course. The premise of the miniseries is largely an origin story of sorts, a mirrored version of the Justice League's first appearance as the Syndicate bands together following the arrival of Starro to Earth. The Crime Syndicate, this time around, is composed of six members, each one a counterpart of the main League. We have Superman's copy, Ultraman, no not that one, Batman's copy, Owlman, Wonder Woman's copy, Superwoman, Green Lantern, specifically Jon Stewart's copy, Emerald Knight, Flash's copy, Johnny Quick, no not that one, and the Adam's copy, Atomica. This version of Earth-3 and the Syndicate are a large conglomeration of all the previous versions of the team, with the pre-Crisis version of Earth-3 being largely intact, save for the inclusion of other villains and heroes, and the costumes being a wide mix of all the previous versions of the characters, as well as some new additions, with the exception of Johnny Quick, who has an entirely new one which looks like total dog shit. I'm just gonna be blunt about it right up front, it's absolutely terrible. What were they thinking? Personality-wise, it's all over the place, though, both for good and for bad. Some, like Ultraman and Knight, aren't inherently evil and simply take the ultimate extreme when it comes to trying to help people. Ultraman is influenced by his upbringing, seeing the average citizens as freeloaders who he's forced to clean up after, and Knight isn't a bad guy at all, but is being influenced by the Power Ring to be a heavy-handed, brutal tyrant, with his struggle to resist its temptations to go all out with its power. On the other hand, you have Quick and Atomica, who are unhinged psychopaths who are basically just being evil for evil's sake. This contrast is interesting to see, but doesn't get utilized very much. However, the short issue count certainly affects that as well. The series attempts to have every issue be told from the perspective of, and focus on, one of the six members. However, it doesn't really work out that way and falls a bit flat. It works well in the first two issues, focusing on Ultraman and Owlman respectively, as they react to and to prepare to try to stop Starro. But from there, the remaining narrations don't really work at all that much, since the character in question either isn't the sole focus, or isn't really doing anything. 
If anything, a majority of the story focuses on Knight, his attempts to break free from the ring's influence and partnering up with Sinestro and Luthor's own superhero team. And as a story arc, this is honestly really good, but this ends up making the story feel a bit confused, especially once Starro is beaten since after that everyone else just kinda dicks around. Ultraman, Owlman, and Superwoman, seeing the oncoming arms race of power due to the sudden appearance of hundreds of other metahumans following the attack on Starro, band together and try to get the world's metas under their influence. But this pretty much happens off screen while the focus is on Luthor's own attempts. I like Earth 3 Luthor here. He ironically feels a lot like Superman in many ways, and his determination to do good for selfless reasons in the face of the constant setbacks the Syndicate throw his way, even if he never gets a win in the end. Minor petty thing though, I think he should have hair. Good Luthor should always have hair. It seems like a weird point to stick on, but I'm willing to die on that hill. Johnny Quick and Atomica get it especially bad, doing a massive load of absolutely nothing for the entire story, and by the time they get any kind of spotlight, Johnny gets killed and then the story's over anyways. There is plenty of opportunity to really take advantage of the alternate Earth and get to show off interesting takes on other, more familiar characters, but unfortunately the opportunity isn't taken. I do like the story with Sinestro and John, though. I like how Sinestro is trying to help John get free of his ring's control, but is ultimately still forcing his own wishes on John in doing so, because it doesn't matter what universe he's in, Sinestro is just always a total dick. If the story focused more heavily on Knight throughout, I think this might have been able to be really expanded into a fascinating take, especially focusing on the hypocritical leanings of it, and while as is, it's handled fairly well, I feel like it could have been expanded on more. But the same can be said of most of the story concepts in this. It would have worked better if each issue focused on each member individually with them getting together at the end. While I wouldn't say it struggles to fill space, it also leaves a lot to be desired. I do think there's a great attention to detail when it comes to the reversed elements of Earth 3's history. It's minor set dressing, but it stays consistent, to major stuff like the role of the Lanterns and the Guardians, to Ultraman becoming more powerful from kryptonite exposure, and even tiny minor elements like down to how America is spelled. I do also like the callbacks and editorial notes referring to stories or specific issues that never actually existed. I've said before, but I always find these fun, and they're generally limited to one or two an issue. Although it does bug me a bit that they point out that they're not real, although I'll chalk that up to them wanting to stupid proof the comic. And every issue comes with a short backup detailing the origin of each member of the team, substituting Brian Hitch for the art, and I like most of them. I like the takes on the original origins of the Syndicate's counterparts, playing them straight for the most part with a twist, like how Ultraman's parents were basically exploiting him and his powers and put him in a situation where he didn't want to be seen as a freeloader, or Owlman finding out the circumstances of his parents' death basically made his crusade pointless. Knights feels like it has the most thought put into it, him being a regular beat cop who took a bribe to help his family, both destroying his reputation as an officer and his relationship with his family. It really serves to show that he should have been the central focus of the story. The art is pretty good overall. McOwen has a good eye for action and is able to make things flow fairly naturally from panel to panel, making everything feel really dynamic in the process. The use of heavy amounts of black and thick line work make the visuals seem very solid as well, helping the process, although a lot of smaller details tend to get lost because of it. The coloring isn't anything special though. The color palette, beyond the costumes, is pretty flat, and while it doesn't really actively detract from the artwork, it also doesn't enhance it in any way. As well, there isn't much care given for where light should be coming from panel to panel, leading to it coming off as there's a big spotlight pointed directly at everyone at all times, which also clashes with the black shadowing. At the end of the day, Crime Syndicate is an entertaining spectacle, but doesn't have much substance to it. Earth 3 is a treasure trove of ideas, and it's sad to see it not taken to its fullest advantage of, but it's great to see the Crime Syndicate back in action. It does a good job at subverting the usual expectations you see from a standard hero story and provides an entertaining what-if of sorts to the founding of the Justice League, but beyond that doesn't have much going for it on its own. I think the idea of taking familiar stories but flipping everyone around can get some mileage, but can only go so far on its own. I think it would have worked better as an anthology, with each issue focusing on one of the team members and then one final issue having everyone team up, but I wouldn't say it's a disappointment that it doesn't. It does what it set out to do and accomplishes it fairly well. It just wasn't setting its sights very high as all. I would say give it a read, if only to get a quick crash course on what Earth 3 is all about, if anything. But all that aside, my opening statements do relate to the other topic we have this time around, the Hacker Files. 
Written and created by Lewis Shiner, sci-fi author and an early adopter of the cyberpunk genre, and in terms of comics wrote perfect fodder for this show, Time Masters, with art by Tom Sutton on pencils, Lovern Kinzerski on colors, and Mark Buckingham on inking. Hacker Files was a 12-issue series published by, you guessed it, DC Comics between 1992 and 1993. The central plot of the series centers around Jack Marshall, disgruntled computer programmer and hacker for hire. When Marshall's called in to deal with a rogue virus wreaking havoc in the Pentagon, he discovers an intricate web of conspiracy spread across the digital landscape, all leading back to his former employer's Digitronics. His creations being exploited for evil, Marshall becomes personally invested in the conspiracy, and goes on a quest to uncover what Digitronics is plotting and put a stop to it before it's too late. The series is what I would describe as cyberpunk light. Shiner himself doesn't consider the series as one, but it contains many hallmarks of the genre, although it keeps itself relatively subdued and doesn't go too out there like some other stories in the genre. It takes a very simple approach to technology and hacking in general, portraying a more realistic take on the process and how the tech all fits together. And while I wouldn't exactly call the story or the scenarios Marshall gets into ordinary by any means, it definitely is a major contrast from what DC was publishing at the time, focusing predominantly on civilian-level problems and almost completely devoid of anything cape-related. Hell, I didn't even realize it was within main continuity until about halfway into the series. The actual depiction of the tech and how hacking works as well is fairly accurate. I'll admit I wouldn't exactly call myself an expert by any means, and for once my lawyer isn't forcing me to say that. And neither is Shiner, who openly admits that his experience with coding and computer language is hopelessly out of date. But Shiner also shows his research and talks openly with collaborating and getting assistance with people who do have such knowledge. It's all large, bulky monitors with rows upon rows of command line and file structures. There's no nonsense techno jargon, and everything is explained in terms that the audience can understand, or are simplistic enough that the layman can presume the meaning from context. There's no mile-a-minute keyboard smashing into billions of different programs with zany and nonsensical GUIs, or horribly impractical system designs, which is not to say that it doesn't create visualizations of the inner workings of the computer, but these are presented as being the mental images of Marshall, forming in his head as he gets absorbed into his work and metaphorically enters the digital space. The threats are presented as serious, and certainly have some drastic stakes, but it all stays relatively grounded in terms of the danger, and never fully enters the realm of the fantastical. While the systems themselves don't really resemble anything in reality, Shiner refers to the primary OS seen throughout as Unix but not Unix, this is more in service to the plot, allowing both for Marshall to show his prowess and to allow for whatever the plot needs, but it does all function like a how a computer would in the era. The series is split into four story arcs two four-issue and two two-issue ones, with each story arc basing itself either on real-world incidents or focusing on specific technological talking points of the day. The first arc, Soft War, encompasses the first four issues, and is a dramatization of the Morris Worm incident. For those not familiar, the Morris Worm was the world's first major computer worm, created and distributed by Robert Morris Jr. in November of 1988. Morris, who created the worm more or less because he could, released the worm from the servers of MIT, using the worm as a way to highlight insecurities in many computer systems of the day by exploiting glaring bugs contained in Unix-based operating systems to breach a computer system and effectively bricking it from the inside. Unfortunately for Morris, as well as everyone else, the worm had no kind of limitations on where it could spread and how far and how fast it could, breaking into ARPANET and spreading itself all across the network, damaging thousands of systems and causing untold havoc, going so far as to force the Pentagon to completely take themselves offline in order to avoid it making its way in. The nameless worm in our story operates largely the same, spreading from system to system by using loopholes in the Digitronics OS to make its way through. This results in it making its way to the Pentagon for realsies, forcing checkmates Sarge Steele to call in our pal Marshall to fix this fuck up before things go all pear-shaped. Things are relatively low stakes for the early parts of the arc. There's no real major catastrophe coming other than all our computers will get wrecked beyond repair, which goes along well with the very street-level nature of the series. It leaves any direct references to specific heroes or the existence thereof to an offhand joke or two from Marshall, and Steele is a fairly obscure character who even in his prime of relevance kept to low-key roles for the most part. 
And I really enjoy this aspect, although the book starts straying from it during the back half, when we get Shades of War games when the virus threatens to make a simulated military operation become dangerously real, putting Marshall on a race against the clock as he bolts all across the country to stamp out the mystery worm before it's too late for everyone. This in itself is not explicitly a problem, but I feel like it shouldn't have raised the stakes so high so quickly. A plot like, we have to stop the entire world from getting nuked, usually isn't first story arc kind of material at least. But it does give everything an opening arc should do, and nails it well. It introduces us to our protagonist, gives us a clear idea of who they are as a character and what their motives and goals are, establishes a small supporting cast for the hero to bounce off of, and setting up the primary plot of the series as a whole. The series is written in a very editorial style, with many long scenes of Marshall's thoughts conveying his feelings and opinions on people and everyday society, and even the most insignificant characters are given at least a page or two to talk about their own views or their thoughts about the way the world works. All of which largely shares a very similar anti-government and anti-business mindset, a very punk, anarchist outlook befitting a cyberpunk author. But this one-sided viewpoint never affects the series, everything fits together well, and there's not really any point where the narrative comes off as Shiner ranting to the audience or using the series as a soapbox, although I won't pretend that a few of them aren't all that relevant. Marshall is a well-rounded character too. You really get the feel that he had a genuine love and passion for what he does, coding and making software and trying to help people, and how getting it stamped out by vile corrupt business dealings ground that dream into dust and turned him into the bitter fringe madman he is today delving deep into the hacker culture as the last real bastion he had of his former dream. He's not the nicest guy, taking pretty much any and all opportunity to be a hot-headed dick, but he's definitely a good person at the end of the day, willing to risk his own life and comfort in the pursuit of justice, admittedly his own idealized sense of justice, but nonetheless. The core sidecast largely consists of Marshall's hacker pals, a bunch of dumb kids who mostly serve as sidekicks per se doing the legwork for Marshall by investigating leads and doing research while he's off getting into trouble. They're fine, they don't really add all that much, but they're not obtrusive. We're also introduced to Yoshio, a fellow coder and former co-worker of Marshall's who sold out and went corporate, who's not really all that involved in the first arc, but becomes more relevant as the story goes on, as well as the de facto antagonist Sutcliffe, one of the head honchos of Digitronics who strong-armed Marshall out of the company and screwed him out of the agreements he made with the company's founder a man who champions the power of the almighty dollar and who's openly cartoonishly corrupt and evil. However, he only appears very briefly, mostly to harass Marshall for daring to try and fix things before he gets called away. The first arc is a great introduction to the series, gets you invested in the cast and the premise, and sets up a major mystery to keep your attention. As I said before, it raises the stakes a bit too much by making the existence of the conspiracy known so early, with the hacker gang finding out that the alleged creator of the virus was a fraud and everything stemmed from Digitronic servers, not to mention having one of their inside plants immediately freak out and getting himself killed the second Marshall is a tiny bit suspicious of him, as well as going for the full end of the world scenario by having the virus hijack a simulation and connecting it to real systems. But I like the resolution of the crisis, Marshall quickly disconnecting the sim and patching in his own simulation of an all-out nuclear strike to send the war room into a frothing rage. It showcases two major aspects of his personality, him being very quick-witted and able to solve a crisis on the fly, yet being amoral enough to cause such a panic in the first place. He likes quoting Bugs Bunny a lot, and I think that's a good comparison. He's well-meaning, but a bit unhinged and not above being a cruel jerk to save the day. One of the things I like a lot are the covers for the first arc, recreations of scenes from the main book rendered in a rather crude yet expressive pixel art style, resembling the kind of artwork that was made using the early digital art programs of the Amiga. It's an aesthetic I really quite like, and it's definitely a unique style that makes the series stand out. Sadly, the series ditches it after this arc, switching over to a surrealist photo collage style with hand-painted elements added in that would later become the hallmark style for Vertigo comics. And while these covers are also absolutely spectacular, I feel like they take away the uniqueness that they provided. The second arc, titled Operation Moon Witch, covers the next two issues of the series. The name is an obvious parallel to Operation Sun Devil, which this arc uses as the basis of its plot an event during the mid-1990s, when the US Secret Service launched a nationwide strike against computer hackers and the freaking scene in order to crack down on wire fraud and overall digital manipulation. 
In reality, Sun Devil was largely a joke of an operation, mostly done for show, with the government strong-arming their way in to blindly take down a couple dozen BBSs and temporarily shutting down major hacker groups. But basically no one they apprehended got arrested or permanently stopped, and everything pretty much went back to normal a few months later. This is more or less the case as seen in this story, however Marshall and the gang are forced to intervene when one of their members, Sue Denham as she calls herself, gets arrested as part of the raids, launching into motion a plan to find out where she's being held and set her free. The conspiracy picks up when Marshall's warned about a file called the E911 document, a manual detailing the inner workings of the 911 phone system that's seemingly the major ailment people are getting targeted for, which he finds mysteriously planted on his computer and connecting all the way back to his old friend Yoshio. This pisses him off so much that he launches into action by tracking down Sue and making a plan to infiltrate the government facility they're holding her at to bust her out and steal back all her computer gear. This is of course a terrible and poorly thought out plan, but altruistic nonetheless. Making Digitronics and Yoshio involved with this specific incident seems like a misstep, since their role here is otherwise non-existent beyond planting evidence on Marshall's machines, it doesn't really benefit them in any way considering what we later find out is their end goal. And since Marshall was already working on the incident and getting himself into trouble before finding out, it doesn't really serve as a hook for the plot. But Marshall deciding to rush headfirst into fucking with the Secret Service does again showcase his personality well, and makes him feel grounded in a sense. He's making rash, idiotic decisions to try and help a friend who's been wrongly imprisoned, and his disdain for authority is good enough motive for him to do so, despite how totally insane it is. We also get another angle on the plot with our next big name character appearance, with Barbara Gordon, fresh off her stint with the Suicide Squad, who finds out Sue's been arrested and starts her own plan to investigate what's going on in Free Sue, as well as trying to stop Marshall from making everything worse in the process. I really like the way Babs are written here. This was still relatively early in her career as Oracle, so she hadn't evolved into the god-tier super hacker she is in modern times, and while still fairly talented, isn't any better or worse than Marshall is. Instead, there's a lot of focus on her as a person, how she still struggles with adapting to her being handicapped and the way society treats disabled people, and the difficulties she has with basic daily needs, speaking very boldly about the state of things and just how far the treatment and accommodation of the disabled has come in the years since. It does feel a tiny bit derivative of an earlier arc she had in Suicide Squad, but it comes at it from a different angle. Ostrander taking a look at Barbara from a psychological aspect and how being shot by the Joker affected her mentally, and Shiner taking it from a societal angle and using it to have Barbara make commentary about the real world. Although there is still a psychological aspect to it as well, as Barbara is shown still being haunted by the Joker and the memories of what he did to her, which ends up making things worse for her when she ices a cop during a raid on her apartment, getting her ass sent straight to prison in the process. Fortunately for everyone involved, she gets put in the exact same prison block as Sue in literally the cell right next to her, making it very convenient for her to get rescued. The infiltration of the facility and rescue of Sue and Babs is mostly comedic. Marshall and his hacker pal, Freddy Freaker, no not that one, running a series of rapid fire bluffs to walk straight into the prison and busting out the gang with zero effort is the kind of zany shit I like to see, and shows our hero's ingenuity by being able to think on his feet so quickly. Unfortunately for Marshall, his plan comes crashing down thanks to the untimely involvement of the next big name DC character, with everybody's favorite pedophile mean space cop, Green Lantern. <laughs> when Catherine Cobert, the Justice League's political liaison who was responsible for getting Barbara involved in the plot to begin with, finds out she's been arrested, Hal gets called in to stop Marshall from ruining everyone's lives by harassing the federal government and making everything worse. The plot from here gets pretty quickly wrapped up by Catherine pulling rank on the head bitch in charge of Moonwitch and getting everyone set free, although I really quite like this speech she has where she rightfully calls out how cartoonishly evil and incompetent the feds were in this incident. Ultimately, everyone goes home, Marshall gets off scot-free for breaking into a government facility, and nothing of value was lost or contributed. But Barbara at least gets a happy ending, getting some manner of improvement to her living conditions at the very least. As a one-off arc, this is fine, a bit rushed, especially near the end, but it feels like a bit of wasted space personally. If it were tied in more closely to the overarching plot, it would be fine, but other than a last second reveal that Yoshio was framed as the culprit, it doesn't contribute much. Hal's appearance here is pretty minuscule and rather unnecessary, and I think is a big detriment not just to the arc, but the series overall, but I'll save why for near the end. If the series wasn't as short as it is, I wouldn't mind this one as much, but because of the short length, it's definitely a negative element to the story. 
but I do like that it focuses on such a relatively minor element of hacking culture and history for the plot. The third arc, Working Class Hero, covers issues 7 through 10 of the story, and focuses on Marshall and making a move against Digitronics to uncover the conspiracy they've had brewing, confronting Yoshio and putting into motion his first steps to stop whatever they're plotting. The arc also deals with, and is heavily centered around, the backdrop of, uh, uh, the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Boy oh boy, if this channel isn't already banned in China, we're certainly gonna be now. After confronting Yoshio about his involvement in the conspiracy, Yoshio immediately buckles under pressure, and the two reconcile after years of embitterment. Yoshio spills the beans, revealing that Digitronics has recently brokered a manufacturing deal with the Chinese government as part of a ploy to screw over their previous funders, the Yakuza, with Sutcliffe plotting something ghastly in the shadows. After Marshall hears a story about a friend of a friend of Yoshio's, a plant worker who accidentally discovered that Digitronics has been planting secret recording equipment in everything they've been manufacturing, has mysteriously gone missing and is being held in some unspecified Chinese torture black site. Marshall and Yoshio team up and make their way to Shanghai, hatching yet another daring jailbreak attempt as they work to uncover just what Sutcliffe is planning. As you can probably guess from this intro, this arc is very heavily an anti-communist and anti-Chinese government commentary. Interestingly, it's told from the angle of those who lived through it and lived in China at the time, people who grew up being told the propaganda and fed the illustrious lies of the magical healing powers of communism as they slowly realized the reality of it and became dejected and disillusioned. And I like that we get multiple different angles to it, with Yoshio's friend taking it from the intellectual level, how she truly believed in the teachings of Lenin and Marx, and how the many public failures of their ideals and action led to the ideologies becoming jokes to the majority, mostly because it is a joke and always has been. There's also this policeman who's assigned to torture the factory worker for info, as due to a series of unfortunate mix-ups, he was believed to be one of the ringleaders of the massacred protesters, and how he talks about the manipulation of the youth and the lower classes into doing the bidding of those in power and how betrayal and deceit is simply the way of life, how this has led to the youth of the nation becoming cruel and uncaring bastards, and how those at the top preach hollow, hypocritical oaths and ideals while succumbing to the same greed and temptation and his own disillusionment with his people after decades of service. And his is the most interesting to me, how he still does his job and does it well despite all this, because it's his role in society and he still in some way believes in the true unspoiled nature of the movement. It's incredibly well thought out, and it makes the character feel very human and not like a cheap straw man used to talk shit about commies that our heroes trample all over as an easy gotcha. I also enjoy these propaganda comics sprinkled throughout, recapping the plant worker's story from childhood to his capture in very flowery and overly simplistic ways while intercutting with the reality of the situation is done well. I like the cheap and crude art style, and the over-sanitized, blunt, one-sided morals where our squeaky-clean hero learns the beautiful, majestic world of totally not slave labor, and to ignore the horrible, disgusting monsters that are free-thinking and intellectualism, jumping over to how things really went and the ugly, ugly truth of matters. It's very upfront about it, and doesn't shy away from really showing the horrors of what goes on and the depiction of the actual massacre itself is incredibly graphic and brutal in a way that's very surprising from a mainstream release like this. Although considering that this was written and published so soon after the event occurred, I suppose it's not too surprising. Either way, they'd never be able to publish something like this nowadays. Even if you were to ignore the terrible, nightmarish stranglehold China has on our media production, and the constant, unwavering need to yield and give in to their every demand to butcher our own artistic creations to suit their demands only for them to throw it out anyways, the actual real-world massacre is so disturbingly recreated that I don't think any publisher would be willing to take it on today's climate. Marshall and Yoshio's reconciliation comes a little too fast for my liking, especially since everything leading up to this point made it seem like he was in on the conspiracy, so the sudden reveal that he's also investigating it feels a bit rushed. But the way it's written fits with what's established with the characters. The duo's lengthy friendship has been made known plenty of times before this point, and the nature of their falling out stemming from Yoshio bending the knee to become a corporate lackey makes an easy point for the two to patch things up from. But I wish there was more build-up to it. I do like how Yoshio pretty much immediately jumps into going along with Marshall's psychotic scheme to travel all the way to Shanghai and bust into a manufacturing plant basically just for the hell of it. Marshall once again uses his ultimate technique, that being just kind of walking into a place and winging it hoping no one questions him. Somehow, surprisingly, it doesn't work this time, 
because Marshall decided to loudly discuss his plan at the Digitronics headquarters, and someone ratted him out to Sutcliffe, who happened to be heading there himself. So they go for plan B, straight up breaking and entering, which also goes poorly and leads to them immediately attracting the attention of all the guards in Sutcliffe, who despite having him at gunpoint in a foreign country with no real witnesses to speak of, he decides to not just immediately shoot him and has him get thrown in a secret prison cell at the plant. I like that despite doing basically everything the same as last time, reality sets in and understandably gets Marshall's ass handed to him. It shows that the stakes have been raised and the goofy shenanigans we started with are no longer in play. That being said, everything from here goes way too conveniently for our gang, with Marshall being able to hack his way out of the prison cell because Sutcliffe didn't bother to take any of their stuff, easily knocking out the remaining guards and pulling the classic loop the security footage on itself trick, and finding a conveniently placed storage crate to smuggle their escapee pal back to America in. However, the final confrontation with the cop from earlier is really well handled, the plant worker getting him at gunpoint before deciding to give him the chance at peace he initially scoffed at is a really good moment, and compounds his musings from earlier as the final real breaking point of his ideology. It's a bit of a schmaltzy ending, the gang gets back home safe and sound, the plant worker and Yoshio's friend reunite after being separated so for so long, Yoshio and Marshall get off scot-free for their various crimes in a foreign country, and they manage to uncover just enough about the conspiracy on the way to set them off to finally break the case wide open. This arc is also really high quality. I enjoy the more dramatic tone it takes, and the commentary about then-current events is woven in spectacularly well, and is handled with a level of care and tact that isn't really seen anymore. Yoshio feels well integrated and plays off of Marshall well. His inclusion doesn't feel like it overloads the story, and the change in the story dynamic is a welcome one. I think the rushed nature of it brings it down somewhat. It doesn't feel like it had enough space to breathe in the latter half, which makes it come off weird. This all culminates in the final two issues, Showdown. After their little escapades in Shanghai led to them unintentionally piecing together part of Digitronic's master plan, Marshall and Yoshio uncover the Aleph Project, an ultra-top-secret experiment where Digitronics plans to create a fully functioning AI to catalog and store hundreds of thousands of hours of secret recordings from computers all around the globe for god only knows what. Now racing against time, Marshall and Yoshio set off to a secret compound deep within Kazakhstan to find and shut down the AI before it's too late. Unfortunately, this is where I feel the series falls apart, as it makes the jump from a more grounded conspiracy thriller into a full-on sci-fi, since Marshall decides to call in the Justice League for help shutting down the AI. The problem with introducing real superheroes into the story is that it just destroys any tension the plot had to begin with, and this was my problem with having Green Lantern show up earlier. The plot of a secret global spy network run by an immoral megacorp loses any stakes it might have had when it exists in the same universe occupied by guys like Superman and Batman, who deal with similar, if not worse, threats on a daily basis, and makes what should be a major problem for everyone involved feel barely worth the effort. And it's not even like Digitronics is being run by an actual supervillain, or backed up by meta-human security. They're just your garden variety evil corporation staffed by regular ass dudes. This also leads to the focus on technology and hacker culture to take a backseat to more League shenanigans. Which is a shame because the focus on old school VR technology got me really excited since that's a topic I'm really fond of. Not that the League's involvement really helps matters much because Flash almost immediately blows their cover by smacking headfirst into a door like a fucking dope and getting captured. Which leads the entire last issue for Marshall to get into the base and shut down the AI, as well as resolve the plot. Shiner tries to make a big deal about the League's involvement by touching on the very fragile state of Russia at the time, due to the collapse of the Soviet Union, and how the Russian people are very desperate, and how the League coming in and making asses of themselves with their business dealings would lead to an international panic, but it feels really tacked on since none of that really affects anything that happens. Marshall's battle with the AI is fun though, the AI having taken the form of Sutcliffe and it, it being a digital manifestation of his ideology and personality serves as a good climax, and the actual manner in which Marshall is able to take it down is inventive. Marshall, the gigantic dork that he is, put in a secret easter egg in the Digitronics OS so that he could play his favorite video game whenever and wherever, tricking the AI into playing with him and taking advantage of its superior intelligence by exploiting a loophole in its programming and trapping it in an endless cycle of playing the game, giving them plenty of time to dismantle the AI and end Sutcliffe's scheme. The VR landscape is rendered in an incredibly crude early form of CG, and I actually really like it. 
Objectively, yes, even for the era, it's not very good. But I'm utterly fascinated by that crude, low-poly style and almost human but obviously not designs. It always makes it seem like there's just this whole surreal world that they are just begging to be seen and explored. That just beyond what you can see, there's all sorts of wonderful, mind-boggling things just waiting for its time in the spotlight. And I'm always so disappointed that nothing has ever really truly capitalized on it. And so the day is sort of saved. The AI is beaten, but not really gone. Digitronic's systems are still up, and Setcliffe more or less gets off scot-free for everything he's done, striking a deal to basically pass off all the guilt on him to someone else. Marshall gets no real justice, no vindication for his betrayal, and things are basically all the same for him as they were before all this mess started, and if anything is almost a net loss for him. But hey, at least he and Yoshi are friends again, and that's the best he's gonna get. It's a bittersweet, and somewhat disappointing ending, although disappointing more because it's rushed to a conclusion and bogged down by the inclusion of elements that are largely antithetical to what the series was about prior to this point. The appearance of the League is a major misstep with the series, and comes off as Shiner being coerced by audience influence or DC's meddling to include real superheroes into the story to the detriment of the greater work. The focus in on AI and VR tech as well strays from the original focal point of hacking culture, but at least still works with the technology-focused nature of the series. But it's not really explored in any worthwhile way, and could have been incorporated better. Personally, I think Shiner should have trimmed down some of the previous arc to give Showdown one extra issue to really get a spotlight on the two and give it the time it deserved. Overall, Hacker Files is a very solid series with a rather weak ending. The comparatively low stakes of the story and the focus on street-level, normal, for lack of a better word, problems makes it really stand out from a lot of mainstream titles at the time. Despite being nearly 30 years old, the tech and the topics the story discusses don't feel dated or keep it from resonating with a modern view set. If anything, many of the themes and viewpoints the book presents are more relevant nowadays than it was back then. The idea of a globally linked network spying on and harvesting data of the average person was a horrifying fictional threat back then, but is sadly all too real nowadays. The characters feel well-rounded, they have clearly defined motives and stances on the things happening around them, and it keeps them feeling fairly realistic, even if they're in less than realistic scenarios. I think a major thing the series suffered from was Shiner being unable to fully commit to the original vision he had. Whether deliberate or not, the inclusion of actual superheroes damages the narrative in a way that it doesn't quite get a chance to recover from. Since Shiner and co. never outright say the series was meant to be a mini, and hint frequently that it may have gone longer if it sold well, I think it suffers from Shiner anticipating that extension while plotting out the series, leading to a scramble to wrap up everything in a way that's at least partially satisfying. At the end of it all, Hacker Files was very much ahead of its time. It's very much made for an audience who's more interested in computers and hacking rather than traditional superheroic exploits, and that might be what killed it. Which is a shame, really. If it had come out even a year or two later, it would have been at just the right time to really catch on, as cyberpunk and hacker fiction as a genre really started gaining in popularity around the time the internet became more widespread, as well as movies like Hackers start to come out, and that really would have helped it flourish in a way that it sadly never got the chance to. The art in this series is absolutely a great addition to it. It's crude, with a heavy emphasis on detail, but a lack of refinement to it and a general level of inconsistency from panel to panel. But that, in its own weird way, is what makes it good, and comes off as a stylistic choice more than anything. One of the major elements Shiner and co. wanted to focus on with the production was a championing of the human element. That just because the series was about computers and technology, they didn't want that to overshadow the human elements of the story and the production. Sutton's art is all done by hand, and it shows a great level of technical ability and detail, and despite the inconsistent flaws in the final result, he's still able to draw very impressively detailed and realistic humans. The inking as well enhances his art. Every character has a thick black outlining around them, which helps them stand out and makes them pop against the environment, and the additional shading detail really enhances the characters, never going too heavy or too light, leading to a very nice contrast with the colors. And the coloring as well is pleasant. The book has a very diverse color palette with a nice array of tones, characters rendered largely with more muted or duller tones, making them stand out from the vibrant and shining environments. Shading on the colors is fairly minimal, but when it's there, there's a great attention to where light should be coming from, but still left muted to keep the duller tones. Hacker Files is a fascinating story, and one I would sincerely recommend. 
It's a series that's due for a re-release, personally. I think it's something that would be much better received now than back when it first came out. And it shows that you can make a compelling story focused on the normals out of a comic book world and still have it be an exciting story. And on that note, I believe that's all for this time. This has been Jay, and as I return to the void between pages, I look forward to when next we may meet, and I can share what else I've been reading. Oh.